Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad that you've joined us. We're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the third quarter of 2012. This series, as you probably already know, is based on the two small books in the New Testament uh, called First and Second Thessalonians. And we have finished, uh, now that we're ready for Lesson 12, we have finished talking about First Thessalonians, and we're talking about Second Thessalonians, the first part of Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I would recommend, since this is some pretty serious stuff, that you get your Bible out, open it up to First Thess I'm sorry, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, follow along and see what you think. But before we do that, let's have a word of prayer together. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have so many things to be thankful for. We have these warnings from Paul and other warnings from John and others, the Gospels about, in, in your own words, about what's going to happen at the end. And we see things happening around us that strongly suggest that we're getting very close to that time. Help us to understand this correctly, to interpret it correctly, to incorporate your ideas into our paradigm into our thinking so that we may be ready to look up one day soon and see you coming in the clouds of glory is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Antichrist. Wow. That's quite a subject. We're looking at 2 Thessalonians, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And this is a serious challenge for scholarly Bible students. On the one hand, it's probably Paul's clearest explanation of what he believed will happen at the end of this world's history. However, there was probably a clearer one given by Paul to the Thessalonians when he was there. We just don't have that one. Unfortunately, he referred back to what he taught the Thessalonians while he was with them. We do not have that information. In effect, we're listening to one side of a telephone conversation. So, we now turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the first couple of verses. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to be with Him, I beg you, my brothers and sisters, not to be so easily confused in your thinking or upset by the claim that the day of the Lord has come. Has come. Is that present, future, or past? That's past. Perhaps it is thought that we said this while prophesying or preaching or that we wrote it in a letter. By the way, did, did Paul do any prophesying? He, does, he doesn't really look at he, himself. He, he's outlining some stuff here. Is that prophecy or not? Well, it's interesting. If you go over, back over to Acts 11, I don't know if we should take time to go there now, but uh, Acts 11, it describes some prophets who came to the church of Antioch, and it start, after talking about it, it starts naming them, and one of them is... Paul. Saul. Well, there are several phrases in these words that remind us of 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 5, through 5, 11. We've studied that. I'm not going to go back and read it right now. They speak about the coming of our Lord. They speak about the gathering together. They speak about the day of the Lord. It is these connections which lead many scholars to believe that 2 Thessalonians was written primarily as a correction to misunderstandings that the Thessalonians had developed following Paul's first letter. So what was it that the Thessalonians were believing? Evidently, when he talked in his first letter about the second coming of Christ, they thought it was going to be very soon. Mm -hmm. Because in this one, he says, don't let anybody fool you, because that day's not coming for a while. Yeah. Well, well it, it sounds it, like they... they thought that it had already come? Well, there's two things. Uh, some believed, apparently, that Christ had already come in some form, maybe in a spiritual way or something like that, some hidden or mysterious way, uh, already. You know, that's why Paul says, has come. Or two, that the coming of Christ would take place somehow during Paul's lifetime himself. Now, what we know about Paul, we're now, he's now writing approximately 51 or 52 A.D. 
considering what we know about his experience, he was already 30 years old, at least 30 years old, in A.D. 34. So he has to be either close to 50 or maybe a little over 50 by the time he's writing this letter. Okay? Because there were so many deaths from infection and other causes, especially among children in those days, life expectancy was no more than about 45 years. So here's an old man by their standards. So the Thessalonians were looking forward to a second coming in the very near future. Um, Could it be possible that people were kind of twisting things a little bit and saying that, that actually the first coming was the coming that they were talking about. There's nothing really going to happen afterwards. Okay. Is there, is there any way that that could have happened? Well, I think it's pretty clear that the fact that Paul felt it was necessary to write this second book to try to straighten things out suggests that someone was misunderstanding or, if you, if you will, twisting, as you suggested, something wasn't, wasn't understood correctly. Right? Well, when he says has come, mm -hmm. What would have happened if it has come? Well, that would, obviously he's writing to them. They're still there. It's not the, the second coming that we're looking forward to. So it would have to be some kind of a secret rapture or, or a secret appearance somewhere um, so he, where they got that he like He like came somewhere, then he disappeared again. There you Maybe. go. That's it. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why I'm kind of wondering if, if it's more significant to kind of twist things a little bit and and count the first time as him being there as, as the big deal right then, but I don't know. I think Paul, Paul is a human being, mm -hmm. and he used certain verbiage because he wanted to push him to start doing things because he was, he was really fervent in wanting to, he was zealous about doing what God wanted him to do. And he wanted to kind of put the same thing on others as well. But I think he went too far maybe, and he had to kind of move back, back a little bit back. because they were like, okay, we don't have to do anything. Jesus is coming. Let's lie down and wait for him. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't working. So he had to kind of go back a little bit and say, hey, mm -hmm. we have to, you have to do what you have to do while we wait. Why, why does Paul talk about writings here? Now, we, when we were talking about First Thessalonians, we suggested that First Thessalonians was where in the, in the sequence of things in the New Testament? first book written. The very first book written. We're quite sure he was the very first book written. So why is Paul talking about something that was written already? Maybe even talking about forged letters. Just because First Thessalonians is the first book that we have, or the first letter that we have, doesn't mean he didn't write some others before that aren't saved for us. Oh boy. Did it, well, is everything that Paul wrote uh, good for if, us to if continue you found, watching? If you found at? a letter that purported to be from Paul and it sounded maybe authentic, what would you do with it? Check it to the law and to the testimony. Yes. <laughs> well, it's also very possible, as happens so often even in our day, that rumors were started. Somebody came up with an idea among the Thessalonians, or maybe someone brought it into the Thessalonian church. And they were accepting this rumor as true. Uh, a person may come up with a new idea which may be at least partially based on Scripture even, but focus on a certain point out of balance with the rest of Scripture. That person may believe that she, he has discovered some great new truth, but we must keep all of Scripture in mind and keep things in balance. How many have we seen wander off this way or that way or every direction because they focused on some point that they thought was maybe the most important point of all and this is out of the context of all of scripture. But whatever it was, it's kind of seems like it's kind of doing damage to the whole idea of the second coming mm -hmm. somehow. It's not putting it into the proper perspective. Yeah. So how do we keep our safe for ourselves safe from that kind of problem? How do we keep from getting out of balance? Just don't let what your thoughts go take you away from what has already been okay. established. And where would we go to find that? 
You would continually go to the scriptures. Yeah. To the scriptures. Go back and, and keep right. Go back and keep checking it, studying it, and, and look at the example of Jesus particularly, but also the examples. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ, right? Look at the examples of these people. And we don't want to take a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit somewhere else. We want to look at the whole thing. You mean you don't context. like my bunch of littles? Don't want a bunch of littles. <laughs> And, and yet, that's the way many doctrines have been developed. It's looking here, and it correlates with that, and this. I mean, what wow. is the process that keeps you in the, in, so that you can study various scriptures okay. and not get involved in a bunch of littles? Okay. Yes. It, it's true that somebody's going to say something over here and somebody else is going to say something over there and they mean, oh, it looks like those may be fit together and somebody else is going to say something over there. And we've got, we've got 66 books to deal with. That's right. right? And, and a bunch of authors. Mm -hmm. Some of them wrote more than one book. So we do have that issue. What we don't want to happen is, okay, I pick a verse here and a verse here and a verse there and I draw a conclusion. And I think, well, if you just take this verse and this verse and this verse, it seems to say this, but then if I'm honest, I read the rest of Scripture and say, no, it doesn't fit with the rest of Scripture, but I'm going to reject the rest of Scripture now because I have my three verses here that say what I want it to That's say. That's the bad move. That's where we don't want to go. Do you have some examples of that? How many examples do you want? <laughs> One. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I can... the return I, of Jesus, shall we talk about the, yeah. the rapture? I, I, let, me, let me take a very foolish example. In the King James Version, it says, at the second coming, you know, he was on that rooftop, not come down, should not come down. <laughs> there was a time when a preacher was preaching on that, and there were, that was in the days when women had these very high hairdos, and, was, and they, were, they came to be known as top knots. So he took just those verses, just those three words out of it, and says, let the top knot come down. That was his sermon. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> they had a scripture for it. There it was, right in the Bible, you see. Well, obviously, that's a, that's a stretch. So. You think maybe that the, the problem was a monolithic problem with everybody going? Or maybe, maybe no, people were arguing. Maybe that's, that was the problem, that people were yeah. arguing and fighting, and, and that was keeping... In, in the, the short time that Paul was with them, it's very likely that someone says, you know, Norm says, oh... Well, I thought he said this, and someone else says, Yoli says, but I thought he said this, and pretty soon, you know, I, I, I could very easily see that kind of thing happening. Sure. Yeah. Well, clearly the Thessalonians believed that the second coming had already taken place, or that they were in the final events leading up to it. And what was Paul's response in, in the shortest terms? Not so fast. Then he spelled out in some detail things which must happen before the second coming can take place. So now we go to verses 3 and 4. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way, for the, day, for the day will not come until the final rebellion takes place and the wicked one appears, which is de who is destined for hell. He will oppose every so-called God or object of worship and will put himself above them all. He will even go in and sit down in God's temple and claim to be God. So what do we see here? Let, let's look at the sequence. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way, for the day will not come. What's the day? Okay, that obviously must be referring to the second coming. The second coming, okay. okay. The second coming can't come until what? A final rebellion has to, be ta has to take place, and the wicked one appears. So that precedes the second coming, right? Now this one says the son of perdition. Yeah. I if I'm correct, that, is only, that word is only used in one other place. And it's the description of Judas. Really? Yeah, it could be. You think, what did Judas do to Jesus? If they're using that same word here, then I would expect this, whatever it is, to be a traitor like Judas yeah. was. Yeah, yeah. Well, and an example of that, I mean, let's take that story to the next level. Read Revelation 13. The whole world is going to wander after the person they think is the Christ. They're proclaiming the name of Jesus, and they're, they, they, well, while they're doing that, they're following as fast as they can go in the footsteps of the devil. Right. So, so we're talking about another coming, coming of the evil one. Mm -hmm.
But nobody preaches that in church. I mean, they always well, preach about the, they always preach about the second coming it. of Jesus. I mean, when did he have a sermon of blast about the, the coming of the evil one? Well, we need because to it's got to happen, right? He well, says it's got to happen before the the second coming. And how do we explain the fact that so many of our Christian friends don't believe the devil even exists? How can you have him coming if he doesn't even exist? So it goes on. So now, <laughs> before the second coming, we have this this final rebellion taking place, and it is translated in different ways in different trans, in different versions, and the wicked one appearing. He, who, he will oppose every so-called... Now, this is what he's going to do. He will oppose every so-called God or object of worship and will put himself above them all. He will even go in and sit down in God's temple and claim to be God. Has that happened yet? This, yes. this looks like it's, it's something as important or significant as when Jesus walked, only it's the other guy. Now, if you have someone who says, I have the power to change anything in Scripture, no matter who said it, Christ, apostles, or anybody, but I have the power to change it, have they fulfilled this? Yes. Well, assuming, assuming they do try to make some changes. I mean, if they don't yeah, try sure. to make any changes. Yeah. Then. But if a man comes and he starts doing miracles, starts blowing everybody's yeah. mind and then he then he makes those claims you know you're gonna yep that's gonna be easy to take well especially when people are impressed with miracles it's got to come from somewhere here, here's my challenge to you at this point are you glad that Paul wrote these words yes does this help us it does okay beginning because well, we, we, we can put it with some other places yeah, exactly. that, that help out yeah Beginning in the middle of verse 3 until the end of verse 4, there's an incomplete sentence. To make it complete, translators usually add something like, that day will not come, at the beginning of the sentence. And what does the rest of the verse say? There must be an apostasy first. We've talked about that. It's described as a revelation of the man of lawlessness. Lawlessness is another name for what? Rebellion or sin. Sometimes called the son of destruction or perdition, as you mentioned. What does this man of lawlessness do? Quote, he will oppose every so-called God or object of worship and will put himself above them all. He will even go in and sit down in God's temple and claim to be God. Well, where do these, I mean, this language is, sounds vaguely familiar if you're a careful Bible study. Where, student, where does it come from? Daniel. The Old Testament. Oh. Yeah. And, and in several places. Who is this person opposing God? Well, the name Shaitan, from which we get our word Satan, in Hebrew, means the adversary or the opponent. And is used specifically in Zechariah 3, verse 1, to refer to Satan. Okay? Mm -hmm. The little horn in Daniel 8 tried to exalt himself above God and take God's place in the heavenly temple. Does that sound familiar? Yep. Satan himself tries to claim a position above the gods even rising above God himself in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. There it is. Paul is just putting together ideas from the Old Testament. A parallel passage is found in Daniel 11, 36 to 39. So Paul's description of what this lawless man is going to do comes straight out of the Old Testament. Another example of the fact that 2 Thessalonians has more Old Testament kind of language in it, whereas 1 Thessalonians is mainly New Testament kind of language. It's... it's it's kind of an interesting thing to ask yourself or ask the question, how is this person going to appear? Mm -hmm. I mean, we know how Jesus appeared. I mean, he was born, he was born as a man from a virgin. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there's all kinds of things that happened there. Now, how is this, the evil one, going to appear? Mm -hmm. Is he going to drop out of the sky? Is he going to come out of the ground? Is he going to, okay. you know, there's... He might be a symbol or a representative of a system of a of a force that Satan has helped to inspire that control and Satan controls and it where would be. you get such an idea 
Straight out of the Bible. That's right. It's in this passage. It's in Revelation 13. It's in later parts of Revelation again and again. There's a, Satan is behind the scenes, but he works through agencies and so forth that are out there, the front man, if you will, right. for now, his for now his. Now, how, how is he going to? Well, I can see how that can happen, but I'm, I'm looking at this person who's going to put himself above everything, mm -hmm. everything. That doesn't seem like a force that would do that. It'd be him. He would be the one that's, that's boasting yeah. of himself. He would be the one. So and I don't know. It might be, be a force. It might be him. At, at the very end, it's going to be him. He's going to appear in person. He's not going to, he's not going to, when it gets down to the wire, Satan realizes this is it. And he's, he's, not, going to, he's not going to leave that to anybody else. And so my question to you is, if you were on Satan's side, if you were Satan himself, now I don't practice this too much, but <laughs> for a moment, think like Satan. If you were on Satan's side, what would you want to do? As you see, we're coming down to the wire. Well, it's a question though, is he going to actually come as a response to Christ, Christ coming, he's going to re come that way? Or is he going to be, like you said, a force of humanity or whatever that's going to turn it might everything have upside a, it down? It might have a figurehead. Right, right. And then at the last minute, you know, he shows up, you know, in desperation. To, su to support his figurehead. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to know for sure until it happens. Well, unfortunately, once again, as we saw in last week's lesson, uh, verse 5 here, it says, Don't you remember I told you all this while I was with you? So where is that? We want the transcripts, right? <laughs> no tengo. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, Paul had discussed this issue with the Thessalonians before. He had hoped to make it clear at that time, but they were misunderstanding and misinterpreting his words. So now we go on to the next major section, Thessal first, Second Thessalonians 2, verses 6 and 7. That, that Yet there is something that keeps this from happening now. And you know what it is. At the proper time then, the wicked one will appear. So remember we had that sequence. The second coming, the wicked one's going to appear, and before that he's going to make all sorts of claims and so forth like this. So what's preventing that from happening? There's a power, there's a force that is that is in sway now that prevents this thing from happening and it has to go first. Okay, uh, and where would we, how would we identify such a force? Use some of the it, other, it, it, it seems some that, of the other prophecies. Okay, it seems that Paul is aware of such a force. Yes. He's talking about it. He says it hasn't happened yet, right? And yet he does say the wicked one must appear he had and, ha or, and has not appeared yet. The mysterious wickedness, my version says, is already at work, but what is going to happen will not happen until the one who holds it back, the one who holds it back, is taken out of the way, or pa perhaps it could be translated, takes himself out of the way voluntarily. Either way, he's gone. Either way, he's gone. So what's Paul trying to tell us in that verse? Is he saying something holding what back? Something's holding back the, the progress of this, this wicked force. That's son of, this son of perdition. Yeah. Well, in Revelation, it talks about the four winds are being held back. Exactly. And angels, angels are holding those back, though. Yeah. And so, they're under the direction of who, I wonder? Well, they're doing God's will, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So is it God that's holding the one here that's going to be removed that's now holding back the forces? Okay. Most assuredly, Paul says, the second coming will come. But before that happens, a man of lawlessness, back in verse 3, must be revealed. Apparently this is also parallel, parallel to the mystery of lawlessness in verse 7. But before even that happens, there must be a time of mystery and restraint. So, seriously, what is holding back the second coming? Why don't we see, I mean, we've got a lot of passages that talk about events that are going to happen, like, just before the second coming. Why aren't we seeing those things? And I, I, to be honest, the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness 40 years, right? That's right. 
How long have we been since 1844? Look. 168 years. 168 years. Yeah, the the antitype is usually bigger than the type. How, how long do we need to wander around in this wilderness? You know, Moses said, back to those children, that we've camped around this mountain long enough. Right? Well, as we read for 2 Thessalonians 2, 6, and 7, we notice something very interesting. There are parallel sets of people and things described beginning with a restraining power, which is, a little bit later, a restraining person. The lawless one, verse 8, as a person seems to be parallel with the mystery of lawlessness back in verse 7. So we have people and forces, people and maybe institutions. Norm, that sounds like what you were saying a few minutes ago, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So how do we explain 2 Thessalonians 2.8? Then the wicked one will be revealed, but when the Lord Jesus comes, he will kill him with a breath from his mouth and destroy him with his dazzling presence. So at the second coming, Jesus is going to wipe out the devil permanently, right? So he's saying this withholding force is going to go away. This wicked one will be fully revealed. Mm -hmm. And when God comes, he's going he's to get it. Yes. Okay. Well, it, it said to destroy him with his mouth. What was it? With yes, his it breath. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like you could interpret that as talking, as as. Mm -hmm. You know, he's uh, described as having a sword coming out of his mouth. Revelation talks about right. It. That's right. So whatever he's speaking is doing him in whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what's well, happening, isn't it? Who is this him? Him that we're talking about here. Well, we're he talking about the evil the one. one. Him. Oh, he will kill him. Now we're talking about Christ will kill him. Okay. Is that going to happen at the second coming? Third. Who said anything about a third coming? I did. <laughs> <laughs> Revelation 20 here. does. Revelation 20? How do we get to that? Yeah, well, to just a few pages over. <laughs> just a few pages over. Okay, the rest of the passage seems to be talking primarily about the second coming. However, we know about the millennium. We who know about the millennium believe that the wicked will not be destroyed until the third coming. So, well, but this is a capital, in, in my version, it's a capital wicked, like yeah. it was referring to, to this power that, that hasn't been revealed yet, but will be revealed. Uh -huh. That's what's going to get, that may well get wiped out at the second coming. Because Paul said that this man has to come first, and then he's talking about destroying him with his breath. So, the, I mean, there's all kinds of ways you can look at that. Well, it's interesting. What's going to get destroyed with the brightness of his coming? Mm -hmm. At the second coming, what's going to get destroyed with and the brightness of his coming? And what is the brightness of his coming? His glory. Isn't, isn't that God's glory? God's, God's glory. Presence. So what's going, to get, what's going to get wiped out? Well, Gordon has already suggested that a whole lot of things are going to get wiped out, the, wiped out at the third coming. Well, let's stay with the second. Okay. Well, Fairly what... Exactly. But, but he, he said that this... this man, this evil one, is going to be revealed. Mm -hmm. So but that's, if that's, he's in a dark room, stage. somebody turns, him, turns on the light, you're going to reveal him. So it, it kind of runs in that line, and too. And all the world wondered after the beast. It's not in a dark room. Mm -hmm. No, no, but they, they're deceived. That's why they're wandering after him. If they really knew who he was, they wouldn't, they wouldn't go after him. They'd just sit there and lament, I think. But um, well, let's 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 look at the other side. But, Maybe but who, that who dies at the second coming? Yeah. Well, we think we know from other places. Yes. And 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 we're we not allowed to use those here. Well, let's think about that. <laughs> all the wicked will die. Yes. The question is, after a thousand years, they're all going to be alive again. Are, are they really dead? Are they just sleeping? They're just, they're sleep. just sleeping, but that is often described as death. Well, but this is not talking about a death that's sleep. It's talking about destroying him. And isn't that, isn't that more than just sleep? 
I don't know. It depends. It depends on what se what coming you're talking okay. about. Okay. Let's 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 work on a little bit more here. Okay. See see what we come up with. Uh, whoever this restraining power is, uh, <clears throat> seems to have been already working in Paul's day. Yes. Apparently, it's on God's side because it's upholding law, because it's restraining lawlessness, right? Whoa, 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 whoa. Try that one again. Well, he, wh what's he holding back? Read what your version says. Uh, remember that I was with you, I told you that... Look at verse 9. 9? Try to drop down 8 or 9. Even those coming is after the working of Satan, with all the power and lying wonders. Uh, so back to verse... Verse 8, it doesn't. Then shall that wicked, like the yeah. man of iniquity or the man where, of perdition, whom the Lord that? shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. There's a place in there where it talks and about. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Okay, there's a place in here where it talks about. <clears throat> um, about six. Yeah, is there six? is something that keeps this from happening now. Mm -hmm. Keeps this from happening now. What do you have at in six? At the proper time. And now ye know that withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. In other words, you it's being yeah, it's, it's being held now. right now, okay. and it'll be revealed a little later mm -hmm. and will get destroyed at the second coming. But it's the wickedness that's being withheld, right? The wicked one? Yes. The, the man wicked of one. Law. Okay. Yeah. So apparently this force is on God's side. Because it it's it's holding back the wicked. The wicked one. It's well, it's like coming. Babylon was God's uh, uh, judgment on Jerusalem. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to understand both sides here. That's what I'm trying to do. I mean, I don't. Th it may be doing God's work, but I don't think this says it's on God's side. Why not? Depends how you put it together. Yeah, it's how, it's how you put it together beforehand. Okay, look at verse 9. Okay. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.9. The wicked one will come with the power of Satan and perform all kinds of false miracles and wonders. Now, is it, is it fair to call that this wicked might have something to do with the mysterious wickedness up in verse 7? If it's associated with Satan and, and lying wonders, I would think so. Okay, but then... We have to be careful because if this wickedness, this mysterious wickedness is already at work in Paul's day and he's not going to be destroyed at the second or the third coming, it can't be a human being. Well, he's still he's, saying... He's alive 2,000 years later. He's still saying that this, this man has to come, so he hasn't come yet. Mm -hmm. So you can't really tie that, that, it, that it's got to be a human being. Okay. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, if at the end there's going to be a war, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word, and things are going to change forever. Okay, the two opposing sides, the devil's been working. He never stopped working. Mm -hmm. He's getting more and more and more and more people on his side. Mm -hmm. And if we who say we are Christian mm -hmm. don't work as hard to do the same, so it's going to be... Uh, I don't know exactly to explain this, but the the devil works very, 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 very hard. And I'm wondering if it's the the person we're talking about is the same person in Daniel seven verses eleven and twenty six, mm -hmm. and in uh, I believe it's Revelation as well, in nineteen nineteen to twenty, not the same one, mm -hmm. nineteen, because things keep going on and on. We haven't changed that much. People are still bad and evil, mm -hmm. and there's a small group of people who try to do what's right. And many of us see things the way we want to see it. You know, we don't want to want to follow God uh, the way we want to follow it. Mm -hmm. If it makes us uncomfortable, we have to do too much. Like uh, Norm mentioned a little while ago about if we're uncomfortable, we don't want to look crazy. But uh, like Paul said, he's not ashamed of the gospel. Right. If we are ashamed of God, he'll be ashamed of us, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Uh, sometimes I tell, I tell my son, any place I am, I say, oh, praise God. And my son says, Mom, please. Because you know, I embarrass him. He's 17 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so, so are you saying that, that, are you trying to say that 
there's some level of this that's always happened? Yes. I believe it's so never stopped. I believe it's... Yeah. You know, even like Jesus, he used to talk about the world in him. The world always hates him mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And yet, in Revelation, it talks about what's going to happen, that all the world is going to follow after the beast. But it looks like he's already following him back then because Satan... Uh, because Jesus said the world hates him already. Okay. So things are happening kind of straight across. The reform, let me just go. The reformers almost unanimously identified the Antichrist with the papacy. Okay. What prevented the papacy from coming into existence to begin with? Pagan Rome. It, papacy couldn't come up and be a religious political power until pagan Rome lost its political part. Mm -hmm. When it lost its political part, then the papacy could come up and be both religious and political. So I, I've been equating this, he that withholdeth, mm -hmm. as, the, as pagan Rome. Maybe I've got it wrong. Okay. Well, <coughs> let's, let's <laughs> set that aside for just a moment. Let's see if we can get some ideas from other parts of Scripture. <coughs> okay. we'll, we'll come back. Given what we read in Matthew 24, 14, and Mark 13, 10, and Revelation 14, 6, and 7, what's causing the delay of the second coming? Us. Yes. We haven't spread the gospel to the That's ends right. of the world, right? That's right. God is waiting for the gospel to be spread. Now, you know, we could say, well, yeah, you know, we're in every country in the world. Maybe. Do they know it? Yeah, they don't know it. <laughs> but the plot really thickens when we go to the writings of Ellen White. Especially if you read the book of Evangelism, starting page 694 up through 697. Ellen White says in those books, I mean, these are, these are things that have been taken out of other documents and put together so we can look at them together. She says there had already been long delay in 1868. 1868, long delay. 20 years after... 1844. Well, uh, 24 years <laughs> yeah, after, 24 after 44. 1844. Yeah. By 1883, 15 years later, she said that we should have been in the kingdom of heaven before that date. So are you saying that God didn't really know when he was going to come? Well, no. <laughs> that's I the, mean, that's what you... <laughs> that's the, that's the that's two ways. fulfillment of coming up to the gate at Kadesh Barnea and then having to go back into the wilderness. But, but did that surprise God? No. no. It didn't surprise but God. No. He knows exactly when he was going Don't to Don't you come. think God wishes that they had been faithful coming out of Egypt, that they had, could have gone straight to the, the land of Canaan, sure. that they had gone into the land of Canaan as a faithful people and done exactly what he wanted? Yes. Absolutely he wanted that, but right. he knew it wasn't going to happen. Well, if wishes were horses, beggars would ride. <laughs> well, does God wish that we were in the kingdom by already? Well, yes. Absolutely. Question. Well, do we, have, do we have any evidence that God is waiting for us? Yeah, go ahead. Does the second angel's message correlate with 1844? Well, we don't have time to go back and look at all that, okay. but that's, that's a fair <laughs> question. If you, if you look at the writings of Ellen White, and you look at the, even before that, if you wanted to look at the, the information presented by William Miller, he saw first the first angel's message, then he saw the second angel's message coming, and yes, it was in connection leading up to 1844. And you also say that the beast that was to make war is the, the, one, the one that third angel mentioned. Well, look at a couple of passages, because I'm, I'm watching the clock run down here. Revelation 7, 1 to 3. After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds so that no wind should blow on the earth or on the sea or against any tree. And I saw another angel coming up from the east with the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels to whom God had given the power to damage the earth and the sea. The angel said, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until... What? We mark the servants of our God with a seal on their foreheads. Waiting for us to be sealed. Second Peter 3, I'm just going to read one verse here. Um, verse especially, uh, verse 12. As you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. Who? You. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will melt with heat. 
and so forth. So what about that? Is God now stymied by our failure to do what he wanted us to do? Stymied? God? Stymied? Yeah, I think so. He gets stymied in the in the in because when he freedom when freedom is in but, in but not stymied as as compared to uh, maybe not knowing when he's going to no, come. No 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 no. no. <laughs> okay. Well, on Satan's side, now we've been talking a little bit about God's side. On Satan's side, we know certain things about the man of sin or the man of lawlessness. The little horn in Daniel seven twenty two twenty five was speaking blasphemies against God and trying to take over God's place. There it is, right in the Old Testament. The beast from the sea in Revelation 13, 1 through 7, seems to continue to operate after the fall of pagan Rome. Norm, yep. if we do our best to put all these passages together, is there a certain power or authority that fits the total picture? Many scholars and Bible interpreters, up until the days of the Industrial Revelation, Revolution, approximately, believed that there was only one institution that could be re represented as the Antichrist. That institution can only refer to the papacy. Now, in the last two centuries, many Christians have moved away from that interpretation. Why do you think that is? Does that fit with our understanding of what is supposed to happen just before the second coming of Christ? Yep. Things have shifted. The power have shifted. Mm -hmm. And all the world wondered after mm -hmm. the beast, so you would expect it. So what would, what would Satan do at the end? Working by himself or through an organization, what would he do to try to make us believe that Jesus had come again? That Jesus had come again yeah. already? Well, that Jesus, that he is coming, that here he is. Oh, that, we'll come and imitate him. Yeah, sure. Miracles, wonders. And what happens, look at Second Thessalonians 2, verses 9 and 10, back to our passage. The wicked one will come with the power of Satan and perform all kinds of, in this case, false miracles and wonders, and use every kind of wicked deceit on those who will perish. Okay? And, and why are they on them that perish? Because... Yeah, well, hold on just a minute. We'll get there in just a second. I want to okay. hold that one. All right. So, who else... Convinced by the use of miracles and wonders? Look at Acts 2, verse 22. Now, this is Peter's sermon on Pentecost. Listen to these words, fellow Israelites. Jesus of Nazareth was a man whose divine authority was clearly proven to you by all the miracles and wonders whom God performed through him. Who's imitating who here? Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yeah. What is the mark, what is the mark in the hand and what have you in the seal? What are those two things? Well, and again, that's another long stu study. The seal of God obviously has something to do with, with people being permanently identified with God's kingdom. And someone who's permanently identified with God's kingdom, I mean, you don't put a stamp or a seal on something so that you can wash it off the next minute. It's supposed to mean, you know, this is mine or this is identified as something. So you put a stamp on something, that means it's permanent, you, that you identified that thing. So, what would be, what kind of people will be permanently identified with God's kingdom? Those who are, and to use Alan White's words, volume four of the Bible commentary, page 1161, paragraph six, I believe it is. Those who are so settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. God says, okay, that one's sealed. Boom. The Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, I think, and in, in, in 1, verse 13, or something like that. It's right there in Ephesians. So, just as the beast in Revelation 13 received its power from the dragon who is operating behind the scenes, this Antichrist seems to get its power from Satan himself. Right. And how do we avoid being caught up in this, great, in this greatest evangelistic campaign of all time? To the law and to the testimony. Yes, and the, it, now it's time for you to read the last half of the verse you were going to read to us. The only way we can avoid that fate is to become because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Lover, we, we need to become lovers of the truth. Yes. Lovers of the truth. What's a lover of the truth? Well, read those verses in context. 
and use every kind of wicked deceit on those who will perish. They will perish because they did not welcome and love the truth so as to be saved. And so God sends the power of error to work in them so that they believe what is false. Now this is talking to people on the false side. Excuse me. The result is that all who have not believed the truth but have taken pleasure in sin will be condemned. So the lovers of, the lovers of truth must be those who believe the truth, who trust in the truth, and those who do not take pleasure in sin. Would that be fair? Well, it's going to be people who yeah. don't lie, that's for sure. Yeah. They don't lie. If they lied, they wouldn't love the truth. Do I, do I dare to ask this question? Do we love to study our Bibles and pray more than we love to watch television <laughs> or movies or be entertained? It's interesting that the opposite of lovers of the truth is those who take pleasure in sin. What does that imply? Well, would God ever come back and sort of deceive people, as it seems to suggest there in verse 11 and 12? No. Well, I, I read you the verses. How, what are we going to do with that? <laughs> Look at verse 11. So God sends the power of error to work in them so that they will believe what is false. You want to hear what the Message Bible says? Sure. It says, God rubs their noses in it. I see, wow. And gives them what they want. Okay. Pharaoh, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh's God hardened, hardened heart. Pharaoh's heart. And how did he do they, that? They, they already had a predisposition. And God says, he gives you more, and all it does is make them more angry, more set in their ways. It, it, he can give them truth. It, to them, it, it's, it, they just don't want any more of it. Give them a rope and they hang themselves. Yeah. That's where I was going to go. Give them enough rope and let them hang themselves. This is what you insist on doing. You're committed. Go ahead and do it. Yeah. God finally says, okay, there's nothing more I can do. You were determined to go in this false direction. You're following someone who's going opposite, the opposite direction from where I want you to go. What can I do? I refuse to violate your freedom. So when people are going the wrong direction, it means that they're going to walk, they're going to walk, and then going to run into a corner where it goes nowhere. Yeah. And that's when it gets revealed to them that they weren't following the truth. And they certainly can't <coughs> receive the God's seal. They're certainly not safe to, for God to admit to his kingdom. Well, God is not working to try to keep people out. He's yeah. trying to win them over yeah. to his side. God's wrath, if we can remind ourselves of this, um, is we've talked about it many times, is simply his turning away from people who don't want him. They don't want his ways. They don't want his ideas. They're busy with their things. And God finally has to say, I'm sorry. Um, we frequently the, look at this as, as this was the only time God asked them. God's been asking them mm -hmm. all their lives. Mm -hmm. And they finally reached the end. There's a, there's a clear example of this, a clear verse that describes this in Hosea, way back in the Old Testament, chapter 4, verse 17. It says, the people of Israel are under the spell of idols. Let them go their own way. The people of Israel... That is the worst thing that could possibly happen to them. Yeah. It's for God to say, mm. have at it. Yeah. I give up. You insist on it? Go do yeah. it. Well, Satan has always claimed that if God would step back and let him take control, he could run a better universe. At the end of this earth's history, might God basically give Satan the opportunity to try that? No. Well, he's going to bring plagues. He's going to bring all kinds of stuff. And God is going to say, okay, Satan, do your worst, but you can't kill my people. But who does Satan want to get rid of? Those people. Those people. And this is going to be an all-out war. As the history of our world is wrapped up, what Satan would like to do most of all would be for the righteous to either join his side, of course that would be his ideal, or be taken out of the way. Then he and his forces could be left to take control of this earth as their domain. But what does God say? Nothing doing. I, God speaking, I'm going to bring the new Jerusalem back here to this earth and make this little blue marble my headquarters for the rest of eternity. 
Well, notice some very significant words from Ellen White about what is going to happen near the end. She talked about it using our passage for this week. And she says these words. The Apostle Paul warned the church not to look for the coming of Christ in his day. That day shall not come, he says, except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Not till after the great apostasy and the long period of the reign of the man of sin can we look for the advent of our Lord. That's history. <laughs> That's history. Now it's history. Yes. The man of sin, which is also styled the mystery of iniquity, the son of perdition and that wicked, represents the papacy, which as foretold in prophecy was to maintain its supremacy for 1260 years. This period ended when? 1798. 1798. The coming of Christ could not take place before that time. Paul covers with his caution the whole of Christian dispensation down to the year 1798. It is this side of that time that the message of Christ's second coming is to be proclaimed. Okay, do we know what, ha what happened in around about 1798 that, that give us some clues that the end, we're coming up to the end? Pope was taken captive. Well, in 1798, that particular time, the Pope was taken captive and people thought the Roman Catholic Church was dead. What else happened about that time? Going way back to 1755, there was that was massive Lisbon earthquake. In 1780, there was the dark day and the moon turned to blood. And people were saying, and, and then in 1833, there were the stars falling from heaven and, and people were saying, whoa, hold on. These things were prophesied in the Bible. We must be coming up to something, right? Well, there's also wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes. We have not as a constant reminder, but we just, it's kind of like the sacrifices in, in, in uh, Israel. Another you know, quart of blood yeah, down the drain. New, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's just this time. Well, that was from Ellen White's book, The Great Controversy, page 356. A few pages later, she says, as a crowning act in the great drama of recept deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. Try to imagine what that will be like. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the great, some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people, and then, in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday, and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. I suspect there's going to be a lot of other things that go along with that, but that's one of the main things. Only those who have been dil diligent students of the Scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded. There's the love of the truth. Yep. Will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive. That's page 624 and 625. There's instructions that say, if he's out in the desert, don't go. Matthew 24. If he's in a dark room, don't go. Yeah. Why? Because yeah, I mean, if you go out there and put yourself in that thing, you will be fooled. Mm -hmm. You can, I, I don't think you'll be able to survive if you go out there. Now, you know you don't have to go because that one that is claiming to be Christ did not come like the second coming has yeah. to be. Yeah. But well, don't go. Don't explore. Yeah. Well, Ellen White says that this evil force represents the papacy. She's not talking about individuals. She's talking about a system. Right. that's misrepresented and changing and so forth. And so she, she gives these words of caution in Evangelism, page 576. And bearing the message, make no personal thrust at other churches, not even the Roman Catholic Church. Angels of God see in the different denominations many who can be reached only by the greatest caution. Therefore, let us be careful of our words. Upon these themes, silence is eloquence. Many are deceived. Speak the truth in tones and words of love. Mm -hmm. So how good are we at loving Catholics? Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, bearing witness against the Roman Catholic institution? Yeah. <laughs> Can we do that with Christian love, forbearance intact? We have to. I got to be loved. That's going to take some that real, real skill. Well, there's some it, good people in the yeah. church. Oh, Catholic absolutely. Church. Yeah. It's, it's there's a lot like of people our in our own church 
the yeah. institution is different than the people that's that we so sit next right to. So how, and we're running out of time, how have you seen these verses? Are, are, are they a little clearer now? Or are you still confused by these verses we've just studied? Well, the Jews in Jesus' day read the Old Testament very carefully and believed that there would only be one coming of the Messiah. They believed that the passages that we now apply to the second and third coming would all take place at the first coming. All of the apostles in the New Testament apparently believed that the final end of all things, except for the new earth, would take place at the second coming. It was not until the Apostle John wrote in Revelation 20 that there is any hint of a thousand year period that we call the millennium and then a third coming. So, I believe that what these verses suggest that Paul seems to, you know, he talks about he will destroy him with the breath of his mouth. I think Paul believed that all that was going to happen at the second coming. Paul, God hadn't seen fit to reveal to Paul that there's going to be a thousand years in the middle of that sentence. I should, we shouldn't have a problem with the fact that the people in the Old Testament thought everything was going to happen at the first coming. No. We shouldn't have a problem with the fact that most of the people in the New Testament thought it was all going to happen at the second coming. Truth is progressive. Don't we believe we're going to be studying truth for the rest of eternity? But it was not to their good that they ignored that, no. that feeling of, of nearness. Mm -hmm. And I think God has, has wanted the human to experience mm -hmm. that anticipation of the nearness of his coming since Adam and Eve sinned. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was not until the Apostle John wrote in Revelation 20 that there's any hint of a thousand-year period that we call the millennium and then a third coming. Did Paul know anything about the millennium and the third coming? Does God always reveal all the truth there is to know to every prophet and every apostle with whom he works? Of course not. Why did God wait until the very end of John's life? I mean, it's almost like an appendix to the Bible. He says, oh, by the way, there's going to be a thousand years and there's going to be a third coming, you know? Why did God wait until the very end of John's life to reveal any information about the millennium and the third coming? Have we understood all the information and put it together correctly? Or could we also be deceived? Is our picture of God and our picture of the final events of this earth's history complete? Or could it be incomplete? Might we still be like the people from the Old Testament? Or even the people from the New Testament? Now, I'm not trying to say there's going to be another thousand year period or something. I'm just saying we need to study these passages. We need to understand them. We need to get together and talk about it to try to get this message as clearly in mind as we can. Otherwise, we will be deceived. See you next time.